Need new glasses or want a fresh new style? Warby Parker has you covered. Glasses start at just 95 bucks, including anti-reflective, scratch-resistant prescription lenses that block 100% of UV rays. Every frame's designed in-house, with a huge selection of styles for every face shape. And with Warby Parker's free home try-on program, you can order five pairs to try at home for free. Shipping is free both ways, too. Go to warbyparker.com slash covered to try five pairs of frames at home for free. Warbyparker.com slash covered. Wow. Nice. Yeah. What you're hearing are the sounds of people everywhere putting on Bomba socks, underwear, and T-shirts made from absurdly soft materials that feel like plush clouds. Yeah, that plush. And the best part? For every item you purchase, Bombas donates another to someone facing homelessness. Bombas. Big comfort for everyone. Go to bombas.com slash ACAST and use code ACAST for 20% off your first purchase. That's bombas.com slash ACAST. Code ACAST. Hello, you're listening to Just Films and That. This is the podcast where we talk about those films that we think deserve just a little bit more love. Whether it be underrated or underseen, we're going to talk about it. So this week, it's Dragonheart from 1996. So let's see what we think. Alice. Yes. Dragonheart, then. Dragonheart, Josh. It's from 1996, isn't it? Indeed. So, you chose this one then. So, tell the lovely people, and they are all lovely, listening at home, what is Dragonheart about, and why did you pick Dragonheart in terms of the podcast that we're recording right now? So, we're in England in the 10th century, and alas, the prince has been fatally wounded, so his mum, the queen, takes him to the local dragon and begs him to help save her son's life. So he agrees and gives the prince half of his heart, which binds them together, and if one of them dies... They both die. The dragon asks in return that the prince rules with honour and integrity. But that doesn't really happen, and he turns out to be a bit of a knobhead. But the local heartthrob and knight, Sir Bowen, who was very close to the prince when he was young, believes that the dragon's heart has corrupted the now king and seeks vengeance by hunting him down. But hang on, turns out the dragon is actually pretty cool, and they become best buds. And that's what it's about in a nutshell. Why did I pick it? Initially, I thought I thought this might be underrated. So right, okay. I see this a couple of times when I was a kid. Mm. And similar to things like uh, All Dogs Go to Heaven yeah. or uh, The Whole Nine Yards, I mm. didn't actually remember much about the film. Oh, right, I okay. just remembered the memory of enjoying it. And I yeah. remembered feeling very emotional when, spoiler warning listeners, when the dragon dies at the end. So I thought, right, have a little look, have a little look at the critical reception. I do think it's a bit underrated. And I am wondering if it is underseen in terms of like these 90s sort of fantasy family films, these like action adventure films. I'm wondering how many people now are going back to watch it. Are people people checking it out now on a family film night or whatever? The only thing I will say that maybe counter... Um, argues that is that there's loads of sequels. There there's is like so was, many sequels. That was news to me. Yeah, <laughs> when same. I typed I it into no my idea. streaming service. <laughs> so that was weird. Um, but you love so a film. Still... You love a film with random sequels that still are still going on. This is your th- at least your third one. Yeah, Tremors, Tremors is, is one that comes still to being mind. named today. Sequels. Yeah. Deep Blue Sea, still getting more out of that fruit, more juice (laughs) out of that fruit of smart mega sharks. And now, how many films are in the Dragonheart franchise in which it's about half a dragon's heart? Like, what? Do you know what I mean? Like, and who's watching them? I mean, maybe that, maybe it did better than we thought box office wise, and that's why. So, so box office wise, it's definitely not underseen. Like, box office wise, it was considered sort of a a, a success. I believe it cost about 57 million pounds and it made like 115 million. So, it got sort of double its budget back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so certainly not a a box office flop. Um, but I just, so yeah, maybe, maybe I'm wrong about the underseen, you know, it's just because no one ever talks about it. So with it being, with you picking it there and what you said there, then why did you put it on your list? So obviously you'd said you hadn't seen it for a bit. You're not sure if it's underrated, not sure if it's underseen, but you think it's underrated. But what made you go, I'm going to put Dragonheart on my list? It was the, the critic score. 
right, on, okay. on Rotten Tomatoes. That I'll, right. that I'll tell you all about okay, later. But okay. that was the main reason. And what made it? What made it come into your head? Oh my goodness! Like what? Because like, I know films. That I'm like, <sighs> oh, I, I, I perhaps will be scrolling through a streaming platform to find something, and I'm like, oh shit, yeah, that I'll see how it did, or it might be on telly, or there's ones that just pop into my head. I mean, is this is this just a head popper in in a? I think so. I do have periods of time where I sort of try and really have a think about films that I've seen yeah. as a kid that I haven't seen in a long while that could potentially go on the list. You do, do that, that, I, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, and ones that I just kind of want to revisit because, mm. like I said, this is at least the third one now where I didn't fully remember, you know, the plot, the concept, the characters, and all that. So I'm kind of intrigued as well because I'm like, oh, I want to go back. And you know what I do find fun about doing this podcast as well is when I'm wrong and when I think <laughs> that something might be underrated, I watch it and I'm like, oh no, 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 this Ooh. was a bad idea. Forty so days I of quite nights. enjoy that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I enjoy that. Uh, had you seen this one before? So I'd definitely seen it before. I huh. think, and I don't know if I've sort of um, inception myself, I think I saw it at the cinema. Oh, wow. Cool. But, but 1996, I would have been five or six. And oh, very young. not too young, but perhaps a little too young to be seeing something like this at the cinema. But I've mm. definitely seen it before. I thought, I think it was the cinema, but I can't remember um, fully. But but yeah, I've definitely seen it before. And like you, I didn't fully remember the plot. So I my recollection was um, half a dragon's heart, half a king's heart. King's a bit mm. of a bastard, but to kill the king, you got to kill the dragon. And it's all very sad. And Dennis Quaid's there with his long, brilliant hair. And mm. he looks like Aragorn before Aragorn. Um, yeah. Well, the film was made anyway. Um, but you know what I mean? That's that's all I remember. I did not remember things like that they teamed up or or anything like that. So I was interested to watch it again because the other thing I remember is is being really sad mm-hmm. at the end, which, which, you know, I think a lot of people of our generation... If they have seen it, I think this is up there with like your likes of your um, incredible journey home with Bound, you know, that sort of thing mm. of like, oh my God, I just cried so much when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. So I had seen it before, but I was interested. I've not seen it for, you know, since I was an adult, basically, as far as mm-hmm. I can remember. So so I was interested to watch it again. And again, quite trepidatious with that idea of Summit from the 90s. Oh God, is this going to be, especially because you know it's quite CGI heavy as well, mm-hmm. you know, that sort of thing. You think, am I going to go into an absolute mess here? But but anyway, let's see. Let's see what we did go into. What did you think watching it again? So it was it was a bit of a slow burn, mm. but I did actually come to really enjoy myself. But it took me a little while to get there. I'm not going to lie. So like the first maybe 20 minutes, I was like, Ugh. you know, the, the yeah. script, maybe not so good. Some of clunky. the performances. Clunky is a clunky. good word to describe how I felt if, about it. If I was to draw a graph mm-hmm. of, because I feel exactly the same. That's interesting. Yeah. So if I was to draw a graph for you of enjoyment of this film versus how much Draco is in it, mm-hmm. how strong do we think it is in Draco being in its favour? Because I yeah. would say pretty damn strong. Huge, enormous. It's like right like, up in it. It's like, yeah, we're spiking Not asked, where's the dragon? Where's the dragon, mate? Where's the dragon? Where's the dragon? Come on, where's yeah. the dragon, mate? Get out oh, the there's the dragon. Okay, here yeah. we go. Enjoying it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, May- and maybe that was it. Because a, a huge... <laughs> A lot of it for me, and I'll get into this um, very shortly, but it's it's the relationship between Draco and um, Bowen. So Dennis Quaid's character, I really, that they, they just, they've got a great relationship and it develops really nicely. But like I said, I'll get into that uh, very shortly. So I think the main thing um, that really stands out about this film is the quality of the dragon. So mm. all the CGI around the dragon feels so advanced for the mid 90s and I did read that the visual effects were nominated for an Oscar in both 96 and in 1997 um but Just missed that out good. ultimately. Just that yeah. Good. Well, uh, so so is is that a thing? You can be uh, nominated I'm not, for two I years. I am not an expert on that sort of stuff. No. I would say it's not. I've never heard of that before. But then uh, maybe maybe it's changed or, or whatever. Yeah, I've never heard of someone being nominated. Obviously, I've heard people being nominated back to back because Tom Tom Hanks won back to back for Philadelphia and Forrest Gump. Or you know, you got all the stuff that has definitely happened. Um, but I've never heard of a, the same thing winning. Uh, so well, no, I've never well, heard of that before. 
did, did, didn't win, sadly. They, they just nominated. Sorry, yeah, so nom- yeah being out. nominated, yeah, I suppose, yeah. yeah. So in 96, they lost out, it lost out to Babe, and then in 97, it Big missed out to Independence Day. So you you can sort of see why. Like, that's that's tough yeah, competition that's, there, that's, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, I suppose that's sort of fair enough. So I get that. So I learned something new that that a film can be nominated for the same thing, or that yeah. a, like that the film can even be nominated two years in a row. So there we go. If anyone has any more information about why that's possible and any other instances that that's happened, please get in touch because I had no idea that, that was a thing. So the dragon is obviously a huge draw, and like we you've just sort of articulated it really well. When he's on screen, the film is just a bit better and a bit more engaging. And I do love the relationship between him and Dennis Quaid's character, Bowen. So they start off as enemies and then they embark on like this kind of symbiotic relationship that benefits them both. And then as the film goes on, they share quite a few like quite tender moments as their friendship strengthens and you discover some of the lore around Draco and the dragons in this world in general. And it's like, yeah, who wouldn't want to be mates with a dragon, right? Mm. And I would probably say that the journey that they both go on together is one of the more compelling aspects of the film. I do you, have Absolutely, you got yeah. similar first, thoughts? Yeah. First 20 minutes, just not bothered. It's slow, yeah, it's clunky, enough. they're showing you stuff you're not bothered about. Mm-hmm. Especially because it's called Dragonheart, right? So I don't, I'm not being too basic to say you're going into it being like, give me some dragons. Where's the dragon? Where's, where's the, the dragons, dragon? mate? <laughs> There's a dragon, mate. Come on. Uh, yeah, so, so you know, when you're seeing Dennis Quaid, the, the whole bit of, of Aeon the King getting hurt at the beginning just drags on and drags on. That could be over in five minutes. Mm-hmm. Oh, we, we, were, we were messing about. There's a, a, an uprising and he got hurt in an accident. Yeah, and it Josh. just goes on and on and on and on. That is exactly what Ollie said. I'm just when he was like, watching it. He was like, "That could have been. That could have been a two minute scene." Yeah, it could have. He's yeah, like, I didn't need all that. I didn't need thing, half so an yeah. hour, twenty minutes of. Oh, and mm-hmm. they just sort of. Like, and I get it. You know, you're trying to build up the the, the, the relationship between Aeon and uh, and Bowen as in that sort of because he's a teacher. But there's all sorts of you know. I'll come on to this in the dislikes. So there's all sorts of real exposition issues where there's like there's too much exposition there and not enough exposition about what is going on in other senses. Like I would yeah, I much, that. much, much rather know about the Knights Code and the Dragons sort of law than whether or not Aeon is any good with a sword and whether or not the girl at the beginning's dad gets blinded and all that. You know, all that sort of stuff. It's just unnecessary. So it's almost a little bit it's a bit clunky and a little bit sort of weirdly structured in, in that sense. But no, as soon as the dragon comes on, as soon as Dra- I mean I obviously remember that Sean Connery was the voice of Draco, and he's perfect. Like he's he, mm. he's got obviously he's got such an iconic voice. He's got such an iconic voice in general. And I did I did go into it thinking, yeah, dragon voice by Sean Connery. I wonder how that would go down now. And it just fits. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I can't really explain it. It just fits really, really well. But yeah, so so it's all about that relationship in it. That whole you know, there's a great little bits of back and forth between them. As I say, I completely forgot that they essentially become con men and start conning people out of bags of gold by convincing them that he's killing dragons for them. Yeah, the CGI as well. They they use they use him sparingly, but when he's on screen, he looks really good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit like I don't know. The, the, obviously, the benchmark for that sort of thing is like your, your T two and uh, T whatever the Robert Patrick is in T Terminator two, the, the, the liquid T-1000. one. T one thousand. Yeah, that one, the liquid one. But obviously, yeah, he yeah. is used sparingly, but when he is used, you're like, oh, that looks good. Oh, that looks great. Oh, um, that's great. I mean, some, some some of the bits of Draco in this look better than some of the CGI in some of the films I've seen this year. It's it's, <laughs> it's exceptionally good. It like, is, I was it's really, really, good. really surprised. Mm. Like I was expecting it to be well s- similar uh, to things like Deep Blue Sea sort of yeah, thing. Scorpion where it's just King a bit, and the Mummy Returns, or whatever. yeah, and you're just imagining these guys on like these ancient computers <laughs> putting it all together. But it, it's it's top quality it's stuff, really man. Yeah. It's really good. So I was so pleased with that. I actually think that some of the performances in this are quite strong as well. So I do feel like Dennis Quaid is doing the best he can with what he has, right? Like it certainly feels like he's being directed to be more melodramatic Mm. and to really amp things up a lot. And the script isn't always the most sophisticated or compelling, but I do feel like he's making the best of it. But I really enjoy Pete Postlethwaite and David, is it Thu- Thulis? David Thulis, yeah, yeah, Thulis, yeah, yeah. So Pete Postlethwaite is playing. So I think it's a monk or like a, some sort of brother. Religious... Is it Brother Gilbert? 
Yes, yeah, he's some yeah. sort of religious figure, but then he's also an aspiring poet. So he gives off like real bard energy, especially when he's around Bowen. And I really enjoyed their dynamic. And then David plays. So so Kit is it's you were saying what were you saying? Aeon is it? I think, Aeon? I think it's called Ion King, or Aeon. King Aeon. Aeon. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Apologies, but basically the king, and he is just a real slimy, horrible bastard, and he does it so he's well. So good at it. Like, He's, oh, because you hate him. Absolute like you shitty hate him grin on his so face much. all the way through it. Yeah, and, and, he's he, and, like... he, and he uses his accent as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And there's a lot of accents going on in this film, which might come up on again in a bit. But the fact <laughs> that you've got David, you know, David Thewlis just being a, a Northern King, yeah. just like in, yeah. I mean, he's he's, he's not he, he he wasn't in it as much as I remember him being in it. I thought he was in it loads more, but. When he is in it, it's, I mean, it's got big Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves energy, this film. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's almost out of that sort of template in it. It's more fantastical because obviously there's no dragons or elements of fantasy in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, apart from Kevin Costner's accent and hair. Um, but in this, they've almost gone, right, we need medieval. You know, we need a hero who's gruff, but also just a leader, just a standard leading man, you know spicy sort of uh, leading lady who you know gives as good as she gets and that sort of thing isn't just your standard damsel in distress type character and we need a proper scenery chewing bad guy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's what you get in it and that's exactly what he is he's so cartoony he's so over the top and you are just rooting for his downfall obviously it's just sad that for you know he dies and then ultimately the dragon has to die and just finally I I just kind of felt it was a lot of fun in general. Like I found some of it really quite funny. Some of the conversations between the characters were quite amusing. They were quite sarcastic at times. And I just ultimately in the end found the whole thing really to enjoy. Like I said, got off to a bit of a slow start and Mm. I wasn't sure. And I was like, oh crumbs, am I going to go into this with nothing to like about it? But it definitely gets better as it goes on. It does. And that reinforced my my uh, opinion that I, I do think it's underrated and, and ultimately I was really pleased with how it went down. <laughs> okay, so we'll move on to things that we perhaps didn't like about Dragonheart or that we change about Dragonheart. Alice, why did he have to die? Why, oh, why is he at the end? It's just, sorry. Oh, oh, it's sorry. sad. It's sad. It's well sad. But you know, t- does he have to die? Yeah, of course he does. There's part like like there's part yeah. of the threat, right? He does have to. Right. He does have Why? To, Why does he have sure. to die? Because the king has to die. Why don't they just keep the king prisoner? Uh, because he's too dastardly and horrible, <laughs> and he must die. <laughs> too ginger. I do, yeah, it. I do, it just it's all bad. It's all bad. <laughs> so I totally get it. He has to have it. But yes. go, what 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 didn't you like about? It? I I'm sensing there's things. I'm sensing there's. I'm sensing you've got dragon points. There's, there's, there is, there's a few things. There's three things in total. Um, so some of it, and I don't want this to sound mean or anything, but some of it felt like a little bit cheap. So, like I said, I think the budget for this was around fifty-seven million pounds, and it's pretty clear that most of this probably went on the dragon. So, when you look at things like the costume and the set design, there's just something very basic about it all. Like the costumes all look like they've been pulled from some Andram club from down the road. <laughs> and I found a lot of the time that the sets and the structures were lacking character and conviction, and there just didn't feel like there was much to it all. Now, obviously, the landscape itself was gorgeous, and I think. There are some genuine like castle or fort ruins in there, which we do get a bit of. But for everything that was constructed, it just felt like it was lacking attention to detail and authenticity. And I just felt really aware that I was looking at a set. Mm. It feels a little bit like it's set in one square mile. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yes, There's one castle, another village, a second village, and a bit of forest. Mm-hmm. And that's where it was set. It's like set in like a computer game. Where yeah, you can only see what you can see on the screen. Really restricted. It did yeah, feel really restricted. I'd agree with that. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, and the the costume thing, I just really noticed. Like it, it, some of it was just so, I don't know. Like like you would expect to see it in a really sort of low budget, like indie, like yeah. or maybe even a student e type like film a, sort of thing. A Macbeth. Yeah, some sort of like yeah, yeah. showing of Macbeth or something like that. 
So that was a little bit disappointing. I do think as well, it is perhaps a little bit confused in understanding who the audience is or who the perceived target audience is, because you've got the talking dragon and the magical elements, which feel like they're really directed at a younger audience. And then the story and the plot points themselves do feel quite basic and easy to understand. But then there's some fairly violent scenes in this. And I think most of the jokes are a little bit more directed at perhaps older kids or even adults. Mm. So I was a bit unsure at times of who the filmmakers thought this was for or if maybe they just kind of got carried away with the big flashy expensive dragon and so all the other aspects of the film just weren't as perfected so it left it feeling a little Mm. bit muddled i definitely agree with that yeah Yeah. definitely yeah it's that whole thing again of who's this for so you've got the funny dragon and the back and forth but then at one point when they kill the king that's aion's dad it's like they absolutely batter him Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's quite, it's and you don't see, you don't see, you don't see, you know, swords going in, but it's implied violence. It's quite like, oh shit, like that's, he's been absolutely yeah. crucified there, that he's not coming back from that sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah, it is quite gruesome. It is quite scary in places and stuff like that. You know, you've got one character, the king, who blinds someone else as a means mm. of punishment and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, so yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Anything else? So just finally, and you touched on it funnily enough there at the very beginning, but the way the way that Draco dies. So I, I found it a little bit too abrupt, to be honest. Like, I'm not too sure what I was expecting or what I wanted, but it felt like it all just happened a bit too quickly and without ceremony. And I sort of wanted more, I think because I remembered feeling so emotional about it as a kid, I kind of wanted that feeling again yeah. as an adult. But it all happened so quickly that you don't really... I didn't really feel it this time, but it's nice sort of once he has died and it's like his, his, his sort of his soul or whatever it is, goes up to the stars and joins that dragon constellation. So that's all very cute, but it just felt like it happened too quickly. I thought that I was like, I don't remember it being like, ah, shit, you have to kill me. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'll crack on then. Sorry. All right. Any last words? No. Okay. See you in a bit, mate. Yeah. Um, It is a bit. I'm sticking to this. He doesn't have to die. Do you think? Just keep the king in prison then. If he's such a prick, just lock him in the tower and then tell everyone, oh, king's dead. But he kind of wants to die. Like Who, Draco? Draco does. Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, mate, maybe there's that element of it. he's the last yeah. one. That's he's true, yeah, dragon. he's sort of complete, he's completely on his own yeah. if, in terms of his species. So yeah, ma- well, okay, yeah, I'll take that, I'll take that. Yeah, <laughs> good. Was there anything else for you that you didn't like or that yeah, you change? I've got a few bits that I didn't like and I've got a sort of suggestion of how to fix it. Mm-hmm. A lot good. of mine's really sort of nitpicky, but I found that a lot of plot holes and issues and, like I say, little nitpicks around exposition. So it's a bit style of sub- over substance. I touched on it earlier. We spend a lot of time in the first 20 minutes dealing with stuff we don't need to deal with. And then some poor exposition in that bit where the focusing on the wrong thing leads to emotional beats not having impact. So mm. it keeps referring to Bowen adhering to the Arthurian Knight's Code, right? King Arthur and his knights had this code and it's all this. But you never get introduced to what that is. He just says it and drops it into conversation. Whereas I think what you need is to have that clearer. If that's the rules that he lives by, I think you need to make that clear. And I don't, maybe the way I'm looking at it is a little bit spoon feedy, but I'm thinking about this as a fantasy adventure family film where you really need to establish the rules of the world a little bit better rather than focusing on a villager uprising and, 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 and stuff like that. So yeah, did feel a little bit clunky from exposition wise. Listen, it is mainly a fam- family film and I do think kids would like it. And I think kids now would probably like it as well if I'm if I, if it, you know if if I'm being honest. But there's other little things and what you know it's one of those things when you pull on the thread and you start seeing stuff you start being like well what mm-hmm. about this well, what about this so mm-hmm. it's like why doesn't Draco just tell him that he's the dragon who saved the king you know earlier why why doesn't Bowen know that it Draco is the dragon? He's got a really distinctive voice. Or do all dragons sound like Sean Connery? Yeah, they're all. Uh, like do you know what I mean? Do they, are they all looking at? Hello, I'm a dragon. Yes, I'm also yeah. a dragon. It's like, <laughs> is it like that? Um, why does he care about Aeon so much when he's a little boy? He's a little shit. Um, and then that, like, you know, that led me into things like when Bowen again, very Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, trains the villagers to rise up against the king. Fucking well, you know, hell, they get way too good too quickly. They're like fully competent <laughs> soldiers in a couple of days. Mm. 
and taking on highly, well, not highly trained, but trained guards of the king or whatever. They'd have no chance. And then that left me to things like, you know, when you're watching fight scenes in films, and there's an element of like, I should just suspend my disbelief. But mm-hmm. there's, towards the end, Bowen's fighting two people with two broadswords. And yes. look at it like and going, have you ever picked one of them up? They <laughs> are so heavy. Do you know what I mean? He's tough, they're, man. He's yeah, but they're a two handed weapon. <laughs> they're a two handed weapon. Like, he should have, if he, he should, anyway. So I got, I got on my horse a little bit around yeah. that. That So, but my main point is there's some real clunky exposition. I want to know more about what goes on with the dragons. Why are mm. the dragons all so noble? And like, you know, is it in a good way? I want to know more about it. I want to know more about Draco and why would you just give your half of your heart to this little boy who's going to be the king and stuff like that? Yeah. Is it like a, you know, are they like a noble species who are always helping people out and they're misunderstood and hunted? And again, I wanted to know more about Bowen and his, and his Arthurian code as well. And I didn't want to know about like the guy getting blinded and the little, you know, and the king and all that. Mm-hmm. All you'd have, to, all you really need to know in that first scene is that the king gets injured, mm-hmm. and and that's why he has to get, get his heart. That's it. So I didn't need any of that, but I did want more from it. So it's not even like it's too long. It's like an hour and forty five, right? Mm-hmm. But you do really feel the pace in that first 20 minutes. And I think if you just change mm-hmm. things around, how I would change it is obviously cut it down, get rid of the stuff that we've mentioned that we've, you know, and we've both said that, right? We both said we don't want that stuff in it. Whereas I would probably have, because at the end, Pete Postlethwaite narrates at the end, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. And he sort of says he went up to the stars. Well, I'd have it starting with that narration mm-hmm. as well. So yeah, have it with nice. Pete Postlethwaite as the monk is telling you the story because obviously he's a scribe. So he's going along and writing the story as the monk, a little bit like what Paul Bettany does in A Knight's Tale. Mm-hmm. And he's telling you the story as if like he's telling you from beyond the grave or he's telling you as this as this almost om, 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 omnipotent voice or whatever. And then have it, you know, he's one of the Arthurian knights. So obviously he's not meant to be an Arthurian knight like Percival and Galahad and, and, and Lancelot, but he's meant to be a like descendant or he's meant to follow that. So have him being like... These are King Arthur's knights, you know, that real epic narration. These are the rules by which they led by, you know, my blade is will is there to help the weak and all that, you know, all that stuff. And just scrap the other stuff and just have him train the nymph, then he gets hurt, bang, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's all you need mm-hmm. to know. But by bookending it, I think you'd, you'd give it an even more fantastical feel and an even more, you know, like you're reading a fairy tale mm-hmm. type feel. That's how I'd change it. Would Would that improve it for you? Or is it yeah, spoon feeding too much? No, no, hundred percent. Because it's because it, I mean it it might be spoon feeding a little bit, but that stuff is more interesting than what we do get is the problem, and that yeah. is a better alternative. Uh, so yeah, totally agree. Okay, so we'll move on to talk about the critical reception in a moment, but before that, Alice, I believe you're going to take us on a journey. I am indeed, Josh, strap in, and you two listeners, because we're going to go down the rabbit hole for this segment that I'm going to call Alice Down the Rabbit Hole. So, for this edition of Alice Down the Rabbit Hole, let's take a closer look at the life and career of the actor who plays young Prince Aeon, Lee Oakes. Lee was born in 1974 in Cheshire, here in England, and Dragonheart was his first experience of the screen before embarking on a career that mostly focused on television. And like many British actors, he's appeared in all the classics, Heartbeat, Holby City, Coronation Street, but perhaps most iconically, Two Pints of Lager and A Packet of Crisps, where he played Munch. Interestingly, Dragonheart director Rob Cohen obviously saw something in Oakes, as he also appeared in Daylight, which is another of Cohen's films where he played gem thief number three which though not critically very well received does star sylvester stallone and vigo mortensen but i hear you cry who played gem thief number one and number two well i won't keep you in suspense any longer as gem thief number one we've got mark chadwick who was a stunt performer in speed two cruise control (laughs) and gem thief number two is candace miller who literally only ever did one film so she remains a little bit of a mystery as for oaks well it doesn't look like his career really took off in any sort of significant way with his last IMDb credit being from 2011 but shortly after his role in Dragonheart his parents apparently won the lottery so hopefully he's been able to enjoy a comfortable and fulfilling life and that was Alice down the rabbit hole <sighs> Alice down the dragon hole maybe oh that would have been better or the dragon uh, cave Alice dragon down the cave. dragon cave keep yeah. it relevant yeah I did watch Two Pints of Lager Packet of Chris when oh, it was big when I was fun. a kid and uh, thought That's it was really times. really funny Yeah. Uh, and I, listen I will never discredit anyone's work you like what you like but I tried to watch it recently and found it largely uh, not as funny as I used to find it. 
Oh no, hundred percent. Yeah, don't go back, not, Josh. Don't ruin the memory. Don't, don't ever go back. Don't look back. That's <laughs> no, it. Don't do it. Don't look back in anger. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's move on to talking about the critical reception. Then I have seen the critical reception. You've sort of said that you still think it's underrated. Now we've you know we've talked about this. Film. It's been a very balanced episode. Some good, some bad. Um, so how do I think it did? Ooh. I'm going to go right down the middle and say overall we're talking a middle five. Like a five and okay. a half. That's what we're going to say. I would say that'd be a little bit underrated. I'd say this mm-hmm. is a thinking about who it's for, thinking about how it's aged. I'd say it's mm-hmm. a six out of ten, maybe a high five out of ten. Okay. Um, you know, there are issues with it, but 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 it's definitely I think would still tick a box for younger kids and stuff who want to mm-hmm. see like a little bit of fantasy adventure with a still fairly good dragon that holds up with the CGI. So, how did it do? Okay, so at the time of recording on IMDb, it gets a 6.4, which I think is kind of where I would sit with it, to be honest. I think I'm with that IMDb score. Then over on Rotten Tomatoes, the audience give it 60%, and then the critics give it 50%. And it was that 50%, I saw that, that was like the main reason I chose it. I was like, that's a little bit harsh for me. Um, It's not... I don't think it's drastically underrated, but I no. do think that a score of 50% does ignore some of the positives that are in there, and which there are many as we've gone through. can certainly see the flaws in it, but after watching it again this time and now doing the episode, I do think that that's underrated. Why I'd agree. You? I'd agree. Hmm. You know, what we've said there, it's not perfect, but I think there's plenty to like in there. There is some clunky exposition, but thinking about the target audience, would they like it and would they still like it? I think so. It's probably about what I, you know, I think we we both put it at a low to middle six. Mm. I, I think I liked it a little bit less than you, but mm. it's by no means 50% bad. So if the critics get the deciding vote, as we know they do, let's say it's underrated. Yeah, I did it. So there we go, another episode in the bag. Dragonheart is underrated, we think. But give it a watch and see what you think if you like 90s CGI dragons. In the meantime, we'll be back next week with another episode in your podcast feed, so keep an eye out for that. If you'd like to get in touch with us, it's filmsonthatpod at gmail.com. And we're on all the social medias if you just search for Just Films and That on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. You'll find us. We're on all there. Always putting little bits of content out here and there, so heading over and give us a follow We're on patreon as well so if you want a little bit of extra content uh, then head into the episode description notes for the very episode you're listening to and click the patreon link where for one pound a month you can get uh, ad free extended episodes a day early any support you can give us would be massively appreciated but of course we just appreciate you listening to this don't we alice we uh, do and very much. we are also alice on the television aren't we We are indeed. Every Friday from 6pm you can find us on the local TV network. So if you live in Birmingham, Bristol, Leeds or Liverpool or the north east of England you can find us on Channel 7 on Freeview or if you live in North Wales or South Wales you can find us on Channel 8 on Freeview. And I'm also uploading all the videos onto Daily Motion so if you head on over there and search for Just Films and that we'll pop up and it will make your day so much better. That is an Alice Oliver guarantee. There you go. (laughs) High expectations there Alice that we, you're, you're, you're right next check there we might not be able to cash (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but yes thank you very much for listening we'll see you next week it's goodbye from me cheerio bye Need new glasses or want a fresh new style? Warby Parker has you covered. Glasses start at just 95 bucks, including anti-reflective, scratch-resistant prescription lenses that block 100% of UV rays. Every frame's designed in-house, with a huge selection of styles for every face shape. And with Warby Parker's free home try-on program, you can order five pairs to try at home for free. Shipping is free both ways, too. Go to warbyparker.com slash covered to try five pairs of frames at home for free. WarbyParker.com slash covered. How do you make a name as the city's most compelling compact crossover? Well, the Lexus UX started with a refined suspension tuned for the streets, then added a palette of distinctive, vibrant exterior colors, and kept it going with an available 12.3 inch touchscreen using our intuitive Lexus interface. The Lexus UX, engineered to fit in, designed to stand out. Click the banner to discover more. 
Experience amazing at your Lexus dealer.